Our speaker for this commencement service is Mr. Kelly Shackelford. Kelly has been president of this and the CEO of the Liberty Institute and has been battling for religious freedom in the courtroom for 24 years. His efforts have helped secure the freedoms of countless Americans who are told they cannot exercise their faith. Guided by his passion for liberty, for America, and for the gospel, Kelly strives to ensure all people have freedom to exercise their faith according to their beliefs. Together with a team of some of the top constitutional litigators in the country, Kelly has secured the rights of millions, focusing his efforts on the church, the schools, and the public square. He has argued in front of the United States Supreme Court, testified before the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, has won three landmark religious liberties cases in the last five years alone, and was named one of the, the greatest 25 Texas lawyers of the past quarter century by the Texas Lawyers Lead publication. He's highly sought after in the media, and has been a frequent guest on national news and talk shows, has been featured in various national newspapers. He's married to his wife, Karen. They have three children. But best of all, he's an alumnus of Dallas Theological Seminary. Would you join me in welcoming Mr. Kelly Shackelford? Thank you, President Bailey, for a gracious introduction. Uh, the group I lead, Liberty Institute, is the largest uh, legal organization in the country uh, that focuses exclusively on religious liberty uh, in America. And I look out to these graduates and I see a lot of possible future clients, uh, <laughs> which is good for you because we don't charge anything. Uh, we're free. We're, we're just like a church, a nonprofit. But I started thinking about this and I thought, what an exciting time uh, for you. Uh, you know, a, a commencement, a beginning, I mean, a, a right now, a going out. But uh, then I thought, a going out to what? Um, I mean, this country is, is, is in a mess. Uh, things are pretty difficult right now. My area of religious freedom, I, I've never seen it more dangerous and more hostile uh, in the 24 years I've been doing what I do. And uh, you've probably, I mean, I, you know, as I click through just some of the things you've seen probably recently, just this week, I mean, what were we doing this week? We were fighting, uh, an, an, I mean, this is not a rumor, this was in writing from the Pentagon threatening our soldiers with court-martial if they shared their faith. Now, they have begun to back off that. The last statement they gave was that, well, sharing your faith is okay, but proselytization is a violation. Now, I don't know the difference between the two of those, and I don't think anybody else does, but that's happening. We've got the uh, HHS mandate on the Affordable Health Care Act, where literally religious institutions across the country are being ordered by the federal government to uh, specifically violate their faith. That has never happened in this country. There are over 60 lawsuits right now to challenge that. We have a number of those, and they're growing daily. Uh, Bibles are actually banned in Walter Reed Hospital from families bringing Bibles to their own family members who were wounded soldiers before it was uncovered. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you probably saw a whole classroom of kids in a college were told to take out a sheet of paper, to write Jesus on the paper, to put it on the ground, and then were ordered to stomp on Jesus. And when one kid wouldn't do it, he was actually not only thrown out of class, but suspended and charges were brought against him in front of the student council. We've got uh, 24 years ago when I started doing this, the idea of representing a church, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, we don't have to represent churches in this country. I mean, this is the United States of America. Now, every week, we get a new church that we have to represent that just wants to be a church, that wants to feed the homeless, that wants to do what churches do. Uh, and probably the best example I can give you is about a year and a half ago, uh, I saw something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And that is, uh, I was at the U.S. Supreme Court sitting in the front row when the Solicitor General's Office of the United States of America, which is the highest office in the country that represents the President and the federal government, got up and said to the justices that the federal government had the power, if it so desired, to tell churches and synagogues who their pastors and rabbis could be and that the religion clauses of the First Amendment offered no protection. There was a gasp in the audience, and fortunately, the justices rejected that argument. 
But it tells you something about how far things have gone that the federal government is even making such an argument. And so as I look at the country and where things are going, our country needs help. Our world needs help. And so you're asking, I'm sure, what every good Christian asks, which is, how can I make a difference in this world? And what is God calling me to do? And as I thought over this, uh, for this talk, I thought about people in the 25 years I've been doing this, I thought about people who have been successful in ministry and people who haven't. And I thought, what are the requirements? What are the things, the real things that are the key? So I want to focus on those two things with you in the short time I have today. And I really think the requirements, if you're really going to be a Christian leader of influence, are twofold. Number one, live out of your gifts. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians talk about wanting to know God's will for their life. But the most dramatic, specific, pinpointed will for your life is how he created you. What do you do really well? What comes easy to you? What do people look at you and say, wow, you're good at that? And you go, that? Well, that's easy. This is a large group of people. You're all uh, graduating from seminary, but you are a very different group of gifted people. And God created you specifically with those gifts and wants you to use them. Now, my story, I, I, uh, I guess I'd go back to senior in high school. I knew I had gifts in analytical thinking and speaking. And I thought, well, I either need to be a pastor or a lawyer. And people said, isn't that a God or Satan choice? And, you know, I, I talked to my youth minister, and he said, you know what, if you're called to be a pastor, certainly that's a wonderful calling. But I will say this, we do have a lot of Christian pastors, and we sure could use some more Christian lawyers. And as I prayed and really sought my heart, uh, I really felt more called to law. And I went to law school uh, not too far from here, down at Baylor. And if you looked at my uh, intelligence scores and my, my grades, I should have been an average law student. But my heart was still for ministry. So as I was at law school, instead of spending all my time studying like everybody else, I spent a lot of my time leading the discipleship group for the college students at my church. Not a great plan, by the way. Uh, but yet, when the grades were coming back, I was making all the high grades. And it was God's way to show me, I want you to use this. And I got out, I clerked for a federal judge. You do that for a year. And uh, when you do that, you sort of research, write opinions, work for the judge. And when you're finished with that year, all the big law firms make you offers because you know how it works behind the scenes. You know how, how the system works, what influences, what doesn't. And I had all these nice offers. And I remember sitting in my office and thinking, I just think I would suffocate if I went and did the regular law thing because I'm not called to do that. I thought, well, what do you want to do? And I thought, well, I think the Lord showed me I'm supposed to use my legal skills, so I'll, I'd like to work on cases. I'd like to help pastors and churches and religious freedom and our founding principles, and I'd even like to go to seminary if I could. And I laughed because there was no paying job like that in the United States of America. And two weeks later, two guys called me that I'd never met. They were partners in major law firms, and they said, look, we started donating our time for religious freedom. And we're now getting so many calls that it's hurting our ability to make a living. And we were wondering, would you be willing to come on, work on cases, help pastors and churches and religious freedom, and you could even go to seminary part-time if you want to. <laughs> now, being an immature, mid-twenties uh, guy, I said, let me pray about it. Like, that wasn't an answer to prayer. <laughs> um, and uh, the next day, I said yes. And uh, that's, how, that's how I started. And I, I just... I don't know, I, I, not too many years later, I was standing at the U.S. Supreme Court arguing a significant First Amendment case, and if you've never felt, and I hope you will if you haven't, all of your gifts in play in a situation with a lot of hard work and a lot of prayer and the Holy Spirit pouring through you, you've never felt what you were created to do. And I'll never forget walking out of that courtroom and you go down the steps and at the bottom of the steps is a cache of microphones. And as I was walking out, my wife turned to me and said, this is what you were born to do. And I would have missed that if I would have listened to what people told me. Oh, don't do that. 
you're not going to make a lot of money doing that. Oh, that's a dark area. Don't go into that. That's not as prestigious. So when you hear those voices, I say, that's a fool's errand. Don't believe that prestige is where you should go or where tell you, people tell you is where you should go. Live out of God's design for you, how he created you, how he specifically communicated his will through you. Don't spit into the wind through life. Walk with the flow of the wind and be what God created you to be. But even if you live out of your gifts, you still won't have any impact if you don't do the second thing, which is have courage. Courage is kind of the tipping point for everything. I don't care what gift you have, what talent you have, what character traits you have. If you're not willing to have courage, you'll never have impact. Because Satan will always come in and try to use fear to discourage you from what God is calling you to do, if it's of impact. And I'm not just talking about the big moments. Those sometimes, and I, I am talking about the big moments, but I'm not just talking about the big moments. I'm talking about the subtle moments. The times when you're supposed to just go along. When, after all, Christians don't upset the flow, do they? My Bible says they do. <laughs> but in our culture, we're told, don't make trouble. Don't, don't mess things up. If you're going to have impact, you're going to have to be willing to stand alone. A leader is required to step out first, to go against the flow, to not go along with the flow. And I, I think of situations, and, I, and I, Kirby Anderson, who's a friend of, uh, of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I, we, I, I, once a week I go in for a few hours and we co-host a radio show that's across the country on about 400 Christian stations. And about two months ago, I started telling the audience something I've never said, which is, look, I've been doing this for a long time, and I really feel compelled to tell believers in this country that you need to make a decision now as to whether you're willing to pay a, cry, a price for representing Christ, for being his ambassador. Because I'm seeing something different now. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it will happen. I'm seeing it happen to all kinds of people. And you don't want to have to make that decision in the middle of that situation and regret the decision you made. So make it now, because this is crucial. And I see this every day in my work. Uh, there's a case many of you might have heard about with a valedictorian. She, uh, um, what happened is we came into the office and I, I saw a copy of an order from a federal judge that said that any student who mentioned prayer or God at the graduation ceremony will violate my order and I will f enforce my order by, quote, incarceration. Literally threaten kids with jail if they mention God or prayer in the, in the uh, graduation ceremony. Well, we sat in our office and when we saw this, we said, well, this is outrageous. We, we've got to get this overturned. This can't become precedent. So we looked at the program, and there was a, a, a student at the beginning of the program and one at the end. We thought those would be the natural ones who would probably want to say a prayer. So we called those students, and those students said, oh, we'd love to challenge this. And we said, well, we've got to have your parents. You're not old enough, so we have to have your parents on board as well. Well, both those families didn't want to cause a fuss, didn't want to stir up trouble. After all, Christians don't stir up trouble. We're just going to let this go. And we sat in our office thinking, this is going to become precedent in the United States because nobody's even willing to stand up. And then my uh, director of litigation was in his office. He was leaving in 15 minutes. He said, Lord, please bring us somebody. And his email came in five minutes later. It was the father of the valedictorian. He said, my daughter is the valedictorian, and she wants to acknowledge God, and she doesn't want to go to jail. And I'm so thankful for Angela Hildebrand and her dad. We did uh, file an immediate emergency appeal that was reversed. They said this is unconstitutional. She did get up and give that valedictory address, now in front of a national TV audience who was covering her valedictory address. And she ended it by, by praying and thanking God that she lived in a country where she was free. And I think of what would have happened if she didn't stand up, if she and her dad didn't stand up. That would be present. Right, right now, all across the country in graduations, kids are getting up to say things. There would be a sword at all of their necks right now because of this precedent. But because she did, not only did she remove that precedent, 
but she created a new higher level precedent saying you can't do that to any kids in this country. What a picture of the body of Christ with those three families. And I'm thankful for Angela and her dad. And I think of, I know a number of you have read the book uh, Bonhoeffer uh, by Eric Metaxas. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, and there's some things I knew about Bonhoeffer and some things I didn't about the history. And I'll never forget as I was reading somewhere around page 300 and some, 310 or 320, there was a time the confessing church is the church that didn't uh, become subsumed, uh, you know, with the government and give up their biblical positions. They, they were standing separate and faithful as the confessing church. But there came a time where everybody was forced if they wanted to keep their license to preach, to sign a statement of ultimate allegiance to the Fuhrer, to Hitler. And as I read and saw that most of those confessing pastors rationalized a way to sign it, I hit the table in front of me. I said, no, no, no. This was your opportunity. You've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who didn't sign. You've heard probably of Martin Niemuller, You've never heard of these people who signed when the moment came. And so I think of examples like that, and I think of if you're really going to have impact, you're going to have to stand with courage at the moment God calls you to. And sometimes people, the lie that they get fed is that, look, I'm just one person. I mean, what difference, you know, or I'm, I'm not the powerful person in my community, or we're not the powerful group. Now, anybody who reads Scripture knows that God never works through the powerful people. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not just stuff you read in Scripture. It happens today. I could tell you story after story after story. Just a number of years ago, I was minding my own business, um, reading my newspaper at lunch when I saw something I had never seen. It was a, it was a picture of senior citizens holding picket signs. And I thought, well, that's a little odd. And uh, these are seniors who were told they could not pray over their meals in the senior center because that violated separation of church and state. They also could not sing gospel songs on a piano in the back of the room. And one of them, who was a former pastor, could once a week they would get at one of the tables and they would talk about the Bible, and they couldn't do that. So I, there was a young attorney who had just started with us, fresh out of the military, and I went and I put the newspaper down in front of him, and I said, let's see if we can help these people. And before I could finish my sentence, he was basically peeling out of the parking lot <laughs> on his way to the senior center. And they said, look, we're the has-beens, we're the nobodies, we don't have any power in this town. We never thought anybody would help us, much less lawyers for free. They said, but we just had to do something. So this young attorney comes back to the office and he says to me, this city doesn't deserve to be worn, they should be destroyed. And I said, no, no, we're a Christian organization. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna send them a letter, tell them there's this thing, the Constitution, they really ought to read it. Uh, and if, if God wants them to fight, then that'll be God's will, but we're gonna try to get this rectified. Well, their answer was, you're gonna have to sue us. And we said, okay. Uh, and we held a press conference, and I had all the seniors behind me at the press conference. And at the end of the press conference, I did something I'm sure that the media experts would tell you never to do, but if you feel led by the Holy Spirit, you just do it. And so I said, does anybody want to say anything? Well, at the end of the line is Barney Clark. Barney has a cowboy hat, a bolo tie, a western suit, which is his only suit, and cowboy boots. And he walks up to the microphone and he says, I fought World War II for these freedoms and I ain't going into the corner to pray. If they want to arrest me, fine. Long as it says what I was arrested for, rested for praying. He turns around and walks in the back of the room. <clears throat> About an hour later, I get a call from Bill O'Reilly's producer saying, we want the guy in the hat. We end up on national TV, we end up in the U.S. Senate, which, by the way, was Barney's first plane ride. He'd been in the Navy. Uh, and uh, we ended up uh, winning this case. We got a permanent injunction. They could never interfere with these seniors again, praying over their meals or singing their gospel songs or studying the Bible. We even won a little money so they could hold a celebration in the senior center uh, as a result of the case. But my favorite part about this case is what happened after the lawsuit was over. These four all-powerful city council members that were behind all of this, 
were beaten by the so-called powerless seniors. And everybody in the city saw this and they thought, you know what? Maybe these people aren't so all-powerful after all. So they held a recall election and they threw all four of them out of office. <laughs> and about a year ago, I got a postcard from one of the seniors because she wanted me to know that she was now one of the new city council members. So this, this, just, I just reiterate this, it's a lie that one person can't make a difference. It's almost always the one person. It's almost always the small groups. And that's how God loves to work. Um, I just encourage you, and I think of, of my, uh, my youngest son. He's 13 now. Pretty tenacious little kid, though. When he was about five years old, he turned to my wife and said, I want to become a Christian. And she said to him, do you really understand? And he said, yes, if everybody else died in the family, they, would, they have Jesus in their heart, they would be Christians, but I don't. And he, and he then began to do this incredible exposition of the gospel to my wife. And they were talking, and he said, when do I have the surgery? And she's, they, were, they were missing each other. And, uh, and he finally grabs, grabs my wife by the shirt and said, when do I have dad's surgery? I've had open heart surgery, and he's seen my scar up my chest. And he thought when he made a decision to accept Jesus Christ that they were going to have to saw his chest open and put Jesus into his chest. And he said yes. I think that's what God is looking for from us, that kind of a childlike faith and commitment to him, to, to live out whatever situation is going to come your way. And look, things are pretty dark out there right now. They're dark in the world. They're dark in the United, they're getting darker in the United States. But what a privilege to represent Christ when it really means something. When, when the lightness is going to show up a lot more in the dark. So I just encourage you, live out of your gifts, do it with courage, and you'll change the world.